Assalamu alaikum. So uh, we will be starting the genetics part of this course. Uh, we'll be talking about the chromosomes, but this lecture is divided into three sections. We'll talk about uh, chromosomes, chromosomal structure. We'll talk about chromosomes during cell division, and then at the end we'll talk about a few techniques related to uh, analysis of chromosomes. Let us first uh, define a few things um, in terms of genetics. So genetics basically is a branch of biology. It deals with heredity and variation in living organisms. Now the thing is, uh, some people mix up genetics with uh, molecular biology. Um, there's an overlap. Molecular biology is something in between biochemistry and genetics. Uh, it, it's really biochemistry because it deals with enzymes and molecules and enzymatic reactions and so on. But at the same time, it deals with genes that affect heredity and variation. So there is an overlap. So molecular biology is in between biochemistry and genetics. So genetics really deals with um, how phenotypes and genotypes are inherited. Okay, it deals with variation among uh, living organisms. Uh, it deals with transmission of diseases within a family. It deals with uh, polymorphisms or transmission of diseases within a family. Okay, so um, a subfield of genetics is medical genetics. So anything that is related to health and disease, um, as a cause of or, or as a result of genetics is really medical genetics, which can also be known as clinical genetics if we're dealing with diseases as well. And if we're dealing with diagnosis, treatment of diseases and prevention of these diseases. So our body is made of somatic cells and they are diploid, meaning that there are two copies of every chromosome. One of them is paternal and the other is maternal. Now, these uh, 22 of these chromosomes, 22 pairs of these chromosomes are known as autosomes or autosomal chromosomes. And we have a set of sex chromosomes, which can be XX or XY. Now, germ cells are known to be haploid, meaning that they have one set of a chromosome. Again, it can either be maternal or paternal plus one sex chromosome, which can either be X or Y. Now, the thing is, um, we all have phenotypes, meaning that we, have, we all have certain appearances, whether it's hair color, eye color, or even height. It's, all, it's, deter, it's a phenotype, okay? Although it's not clear cut, it's not like eye color, um, uh, black, green, blue, and so on. Uh, there's more variation uh, in terms of height. But overall, these are determined by the genotype of a person. That is, the genetic composition of an organism within the cells of, of this organism. Okay, So that's a genotype. Genotype is the total collection of genetic material in a cell. Now, this DNA can be mutated, and we talked about DNA mutation in molecular biology. So, basically, a mutation is anything, any change that occurs in the genetic material in DNA in our cells, and it causes a disease. So, it is, it is pathological. Now, polymorphisms, on the other hand, are more common within a population versus a mutation. Uh, they usually do not cause a disease, so they're not pathological, and they are common. Now, the thing is, um, so we have sometimes variation, normal variation within an individual or within a, sorry, a population. So again, eye color is an example. It's normal variation uh, within a population. So, but sometimes, uh, and, and sometimes, these variations can exist in enzymes, affecting enzyme efficiency or the way enzymes are regulated. And this is a field that we'll, we'll talk about it at the end called 
pharmacogenomics or pharmacogenetics, okay, where enzymes can determine how we metabolize medicines. Now, uh, genes can have different forms, okay, so they can be monomorphic, um, having only one form, which is typical for uh, in general for uh, enzymes, enzyme genes, or if we're talking about actin genes or microfilament genes and so on. There's only one form of, of, of these genes. Dimorphism is when you have two forms and polymorphism is when you have more than one form. Now, we all have our genes situated on chromosomes. And they are located on specific regions on chromosomes. So you have a gene, a particular gene, uh, located on, on in this region of a chromosome, and it's the same region uh, in my DNA, your DNA, and everyone else's DNA. Now this location of of genes is known as a locus. So locus is basically the location of a gene on a chromosome. The plural of locus is loci, L-O-C-I. Okay. Now, so genes can have different forms, or what what we call as alleles. Okay. Now, for example, you can have uh, we all have eye color genes, right? All of us do. Uh, some of us have blue eye color gene, and an, another person would have a brown eye color gene, a third would have a black eye color gene, and so on. So these are different forms of genes, and they are called alleles. So we all have the eye color gene, and the question is, which allele do you have? I have the black eye color allele, to be more specific. So in general, phenotypes are determined by uh, genotypes. And since we have two such genes on every chromosome, two copies or two alleles, one on each chromosome, um, a paternal chromosome and an maternal chromosome, one of them can dominate over the other. So we say that this so so we say that this is a dominant uh, uh, allele or a dominant gene, okay, or um, and and. And the other one would be called a recessive a trait or a recessive allele. And usually dominant alleles are symbolized with a capital letter, like capital P, for example. Okay, So here you have small a, and here you have capital B, and here you have small b. So the thing is, each one of us can have two identical alleles, okay, one on every chromosome, and we said that this person is homozygous. Now we have to be more specific when we say a person is homozygous. So we have to say homozygous for what? For which allele? So this person right here is homozygous for the P, capital P allele, for the dominant allele. Now for that particular gene. Now for gene A, we say that this person is homozygous for the recessive allele or for the, uh, the, the, the small a. Now, on the other hand, you can have uh, a gene having two different alleles. One of them is dominant and the other is recessive. And we say that this person is heterozygous. Okay? Now, only in males, um, having only one X chromosome and only one Y chromosome, we say that males can be hemizygous, okay, since they only have one allele. So let's talk about uh, structure of chromosomes. Now, we talk talked uh, about DNA before, the structure of DNA, and we say it's double-stranded DNA, and it's folded uh, around uh, nucleosomes, which are made of oc an octomer of uh, histones, and they can be wrapped further uh, utilizing the histone H1 into what is known as a heterochromatin. Okay, so right here you can see this is an electromicroscopic image of DNA. This is a, a strand of DNA, double stranded, 
of course we, we, we cannot see the two strands we only see just just DNA now this is when you have nucleosomes uh, organized or wrapping DNA around it around the octoma okay so this is called the 10 nanometer uh, fiber and then you can have this uh, the the uh, nucleosome or beads on a string as they call it it can be wrapped further into a 30 nanometer fiber looking like this it can be folded even further forming a 30 nanometer fiber okay so you have what is known as a lot of loops in the dna and and a scaffold a three-dimensional structure eventually what you have in here is dna can be organized into the typically uh, the the chromosomes and this is how they typically look like in the meta phase during the cell cycle or cell division and we'll talk about it later now uh, pay attention to the terms of euchromatin when the dna is relaxed and this is where active genes or where genes are active and you have the heterochromatin having this structure right here where DNA, uh, where genes are silent because DNA is not accessible. So if we look at a chromosome, uh, this is just one arm of a, a chromosome and we call it a chromatid. Now this chromosome right here, uh, looking at its structure, it has a centromere right here. It's a constriction. Uh, it's like a belt and there are telomeres. And telo means ends, okay? So the ends of chromosomes. Now, centromeres and, and, and telomeres are made of repetitive DNA sequences. Telomeres in every chromosome have the same sequence, repetitive sequence, which is TTAGGG, and it's repeated like thousands of times. Centromeres also are composed of um, repetitive DNA sequences, and there are, uh, there are sequences shared among some uh, chromosomes, but overall uh, each chromosome uh, has its own unique uh, uh, sequence of centromere. Now, so this is how our DNA looks like. This is how our chromosome looks like in our cells. Now, before cells divide, they synthesize a, another uh, another finger, let's say, another uh, chromatid, and you have the chromosome looking like a an X, and we call these two sister chromatids because they are identical to each other. Now, note something here that you have the centromere uh, dividing the chromosome into two arms, and these are called the short arm, uh, which is symbolized as P for petite. And you have the Q arm, and Q stands for grande, or large. So you have the large arm, and you have the short arm. You have the long arm and the short arm. Now, we can classify human chromosomes, or chromosomes in general, into different types according to the location of centromeres. So you can have what is known as a met metacentric chromosome, whereby you have the centromere exactly in the center of a chromosome. So the, the arms, the P and Q arms, are uh, equal to each other. Now, most of human chromosomes have this structure right here, a sub-metacentric uh, chromosome or structure whereby the centromere is in the middle but not exactly in the center so chromosomes would have a p arm and a clear q arm as well some chromosomes have this they follow this structure right here which is known as uh, and these chromosomes are known as acrocentric chromosomes whereby centromeres are very close to the uh, end of chromosomes having very very short p arm and very very long q arm and then we have the telomeric chromosomes where you have the centromere at the end of the chromosomes so there's there's a q arm 
but there is there is no PR. And this is right here an image of uh, microscopic images of uh, chromosomes and how they look like. So this is the metacentric. You have the chromosomes uh, centromeres uh, exactly in the middle. This is the submetacentric. Okay, so you can clearly see a Q arm and a P arm. And here you have an acrocentric chromosome having what is known as satellites, or these are additions. So what does happen to chromosomes during cell division? First, uh, cell division is part of the cell cycle. We talked about the cell cycle um, in, uh, previously in the cell biology part. And we said that you have a, a, a phase known as an interphase. And in this phase, you have these three sub phases. You have the G1 phase, you have the S phase, and you have the G2 phase. Once these phases are completed, cells enter into the mitotic phase or the M phase. In this phase, cells divide. Chromosomes are separated and cells divide, resulting in the formation of two cells. So we talked before about G1, S and G2, but now we'll talk about the M phase uh, in the following slides. So first, we have to say, to clarify, that there are two types of cell division. We have what is known as mitosis and we have meiosis. Now, mitosis is where a cell divides into two daughter cells, and these cells have identical genetic material. So genetically, they are identical. Now, note that we have for every chromosome, and here we have uh, two sets, uh, of chromosomes. We have, let's say, chromosome 1. One of them is maternal and the other is paternal. And you have chromosome 2. Again, one of them is maternal, the other is paternal. When cells divide, now each cell would have from every chromosome the complete set, the maternal and the paternal chromosome. So what happens here in mitosis at the end is that you will have the generation of identical diploid cells. Now, this mitosis takes place uh, throughout our life and in, in almost every cell. So cells that are regenerated, they undergo mitosis. So here what we have is uh, what is known as asexual reproduction. Meiosis, on the other hand, is where you have, uh, it, it, you have separation of chromosomes or cell division going on, whereby you have the formation of two unique cells, genetically speaking. So each cell would have either a maternal chromosome or a paternal chromosome. Okay? Now, this takes place mainly in reproductive cells, in sperm and egg. Okay. Now, eventually you have the formation of haploid cells having only one chromosome uh, from every set. Okay. So, this is meiosis, and it's divided into two phases, two stages. You have meiosis one, and you have meiosis two. So this is mitosis. These are the stages of mitosis. Now, you can have a stage within a stage, or diff uh, these stages can be divided into uh, different stages as well, or different steps. But overall, these are the main steps. You have the prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Now, in the prophase, what happens is that chromosomes start to condense and they become visible. Now, normally in cells uh, that are not dividing, our chromosomes look like spaghetti. Really, they look like spaghetti and they are, uh, um, they are mingled with each other. Now, what happens before uh, getting into mitosis is that chromosomes condense and each one of them gets separated from the other. Now, 
What happens as well is that you have the formation of spindle fibers, and these spindle fibers are formed from centrioles. So this is where uh, microtubules are formed. They emerge from these centri centrioles, and, these cent and each centriole uh, would uh, be located on an opposite pole of cells, an opposite end of cells. What happens then also is that the nuclear envelope is broken down. So we talked about that before, and we talked about the nuclear uh, lamina. And remember I said that lamin proteins are intermediate filaments, and they, are, they get disassembled by phosphorylation. And kinases that are activated during the cell cycle phosphorylate intermediate filaments, resulting in the disassembly of the nuclear matrix and the nuclear envelope as well. And so what happens again, centrioles move uh, towards each uh, opposite poles of cells. Now in the pro-meta phase, um, what happens is that chromosomes continue to condense and you have the formation of kinetic cores. Kinetic cores are com protein complexes that are associated with uh, centromeres and they associate, they bind to spindle fibers that are generated from centrioles, okay? So what happens here is that you have the formation of this protein complex, kinetic core, and this is where microtubules or spindle fibers would attach to. Okay. Now, in the metaphase, what happens is that chromosomes line up exactly in the middle of, uh, of cells, and, um, and each sister chromatid would be attached to the spindle fiber. Now, in anaphase, what happens is that now you have this pulling of centromeres into opposite poles. So each sister chromatid is, is pulled uh, toward one pole. Um, and finally, in the telophase, telo again means end, uh, you have the reformation of the nuclear envelope. Uh, uh, chromosomes arrive at the end of cells or the, the, the poles at, at each pole and uh, spindle fibers break uh, break down and um, and cells get elongated uh, in right before cytokinesis or right before cells divide okay now meiosis on the other hand, uh, is driven or it takes place in two phases, and they're called meiosis one and meiosis two. Right before meiosis, uh, right before meiosis takes place, you have these two homologous chromosomes, uh, meaning that one of them is paternal, the other is maternal, and so they're called homologous chromosomes. You have DNA replication, and you have uh, sister chromatids formed. Uh, for each chromosome. Now, in meiosis one, you have the reductional division, meaning that um, the number of chromosomes is reduced. In meiosis two, it's you have the e equational uh, division, looking exactly like um, mitosis, actually. So the end result is the formation of haploid cells. So these are the stages, okay? So here, this is meiosis one, the reductional phase. What happens is that you have uh, these homologous chromosomes. Uh, 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 you have chromosomes uh, get condensed. You have the dissolution of the nuclear envelope and, and you have crossover uh, between the different chromosomes, between homologous chromosomes. So let me, now, meiosis II, um, here, uh, by the way, here we have the generation of uh, two cells that are genetically different from each other. Now, in meiosis II, what you have in here is uh, prophase II, again, um, you have uh, chromosomes getting condensed, and um, you have the formation of the uh, spindle fiber around them. And in metaphase two, 
uh, chromosomes line up and then you have anaphase the separation of chromosomes uh, from the centromeres and finally have telophase 2 and cytokinesis generating completely different cells genetically as well now so this is the idea of crossing over is basically you have a certain point and this point is known as chiasma chiasma is where you have exchange of genetic material you have fusion of of the dna material of chromosomes at this point and where you have exchange of genetic material now per chromosome you have about uh, five chiasmas um, can possibly take place so here you have two chromosomes right here and this is an illustration and you can see how many chiasmas uh, that can be formed uh, between cells between chromosomes chromosomes so what is the genetic consequence of um, uh, meiosis well one reduction of chromosome number that is formation of haploid cells okay number two is random assortment of chromosomes meaning that the way chromosomes line up determine the distribution of paternal and maternal chromosomes so right here you can have if you have three chromosomes right here for example you can have different ways by which they can be distributed now if you think about it that we have 23 chromosomes and and there are two ways by which these chromosomes can be separated there are eight over eight million possibilities of how these chromosomes can be separated into daughter cells now the other thing is that and that increases variation and this is an important point now something else that increases variation is the crossing over which is uh, also called gene shuffling because you can have on one chromosome a paternal gene and right next to it you can have a maternal gene and so on or alleles I should say okay so uh, that produces even more variation among individuals so now let's talk about uh, different ways by which we can analyze chromosomes now in order to uh, examine chromosomes um, it's it's easier or it's better to look at chromosomes as they look like in the meta phase that is when they are condensed and they look like uh, X's so in order to separate or to isolate such chromosomes it's better to take it from proliferating cells so there are different sources of proliferating cells primarily uh, cells can be taken from uh, white blood cells specifically T lymphocytes uh, cells can be isolated from the bone marrow as well as uh, in in, uh, in pregnant women uh, chromosomes can be separated or isolated from chorionic villi biopsy so basically we're talking about uh, uh, placental cells okay let me just uh, zoom in here as well Chrom uh, chromosomes can also be isolated from skin or organ biopsies again from proliferating so this is basically uh, the uh, protocol or steps for how we can isolate chromosomes um, blood can be withdrawn from an individual about five mils um, T cells are isolated and they are stimulated to proliferate by a, a chemical known as phytohemagglutinin now and this takes place in culture in laboratories for about three days then colchicine is added we talked about colchicine before what colchicine does is that it prevents it blocks the formation of spindle fibers so chromosomes stay condensed in cells and cells cannot divide then cells are fixed they are spread on a glass slide and uh, trypsin is added 
to digest uh, proteins associated with DNA and then a dye known as Gimza is added. Now, and, and chromosomes would look something like this. And then these can be organized, um, uh, placed, um, whereby you, you have homologous chromosomes lining up like this. Now, it's basically uh, images of each chromosome are taken and, and then the images are, are lining up. It's not that we line up chromosomes looking like this. So this is known as a karyotype. So a karyotype is basically the image that you see here to the right. It's basically a representation of how chromosomes look like. And usually chromosomes are arranged according to their number. So you have chromosome 1, next to it chromosome 2, and next to it is chromosome 3, and so on. So they're organized uh, this way. And chromosome 1 is the longest, chromosome 22 is the shortest. Now, so homologous chromosomes are placed next to each other. Okay, so here, uh, DNA, uh, this uh, chromosome, chromosomes are taken from uh, females from a female cell. Now, chromosomes can be illustrated as an ideogram looking like this. So this is like a drawing of chromosomes and how they look like. Now, note the banding pattern of chromosomes. Each chromosome has its own banding pattern. And the, these bands are formed according to how much Gimza dye there is uh, associated with this part or this region of chromosomes. Now, there are different types of banding, different types of staining chromosomes. And they're known as G banding, R banding, C, Q, T, and silver staining. We're not gonna talk about T banding, but we'll talk about the other one. Now, G banding is what I've just shown you, okay? So, whenever you have a dark band, it represents heterochromatic regions. These are the, the regions that include inactive genes. And usually they are AT rich regions. So what Gimza does is that it actually binds, it has, a, it has higher affinity towards AT rich regions. And usually they are located in heterochromatic regions. And, they, and heterochromatin is the part of chromosome or DNA that is not transcriptionally active. Whenever you see light bands, uh, these light bands represent uh, U-chromatin, usually it is GC-rich, containing active genes. And usually in, in a G-banding uh, staining of chromosomes, you have about a total of 300 to 400 bands uh, among the, the uh, all chromosomes. So R banding is the reverse of G banding, literally the reverse. So in G banding, the dark regions become uh, light regions in, the, in, in R banding and light regions become dark regions. Now, the reason behind it is that DNA is melted and resulting in separation of the, the two DNA strands at the AT rich regions. So when, but not, but the GC rich regions are maintained as double stranded DNA. When Gimza is added, it binds to the GC rich region, but not the AT rich regions because they are not double stranded anymore. So the GC rich regions are, uh, are stained, but not the AT rich regions. Now, usually this R banding uh, is used um, to, to look at deletions in chromosomes. So you can see here, this is a normal chromosome, chromosome 14. This is using G banding right here. And this is the same, well, this is, and then you have a deletion of this region that contains this um, uh, region right here, this AT rich region right here. And you can see how it's gone. It's not there anymore. Now, if you look at the R banding, it becomes clear. Now, the light region here, this one here, 
the light region here is the same as the dark region right there and the light region here is the same as this dark region note that and this region the dark region here is the same as the light region in here notice that when this region is deleted you have fusion of these two dark regions into one so you can see that it's it's more obvious in r banding versus g banding now c banding is rarely used in diagnostics and basically what it does is that it's a stain uh, that is uh, that has high affinity for centromeres so centromeres uh, can be um, seen in c banding now q banding relies on the use of a chemical known as uh, quinacerine and this chemical right here can be examined under the uv light the banding pattern is similar to that of g banding and it's useful to recognize chromosomal translocations. So you can see here, for example, chromosome one, you have a missing piece and it exists right here on chromosome 19. So you have this part of the chromosome translocated, okay? Now, silver staining is another technique by which DNA can be uh, stained. Except that with silver staining, what's stained is what is known as nucleolar organization region. Okay, um, the, it doesn't stain DNA; it rather stains proteins in the nucleolar organization region. Now, this the, the if you remember if from the uh, lecture on, on nucleus, um, the nucleolus contains the genes that are uh, the rRNA genes that are active okay so with silver nitrate we stain these regions we stain specifically the rRNA genes so usually it is used as a marker it can be used to indicate the active transcription of tumors um, or to examine how active uh, transcription is in tumors now the thing is we said that when we do uh, this banding of, of an, and staining of chromosomes we're using chromosomes from the metaphase okay now these chromosomes are highly condensed now if chromosomes are removed from the prophase or the pro metaphase then they would be more extended and more relaxed and when the chromosomes are stained you would have the formation of more bands okay so that gives you uh, a sort of like better resolution so you can see here this is the same chromosome uh, at in, in the meta phase you can see about 400 to 500 different bands if it's isolated from the pro metaphase you can see how extended it is and you can see more bands 500 to 600 bands and if it's isolated from the pro phase you can see how more extended it is and you have up to 800 bands appearing same thing here with the x chromosome uh, taken from three different phases uh, metaphase pro metaphase and pro phase and you can have more bands appearing in chromosomes so basically uh, it allows for detection of less obvious abnormalities than conventional g banding well let's talk about another technique that is commonly used in hospitals and clinical laboratories and it's called fish or fluorescent in situ hybridization so this technique relies on the use of probes dna probes for specific regions and these probes are fluorescently labeled now there are different probes that can be used here i'm focusing on four of them you can use gene specific probes so right here for example you're targeting a specific gene with a probe and it's labeled or you can use centromeric probes 
Okay, so it can be uh, chromosome specific since each chromosome has a specific sequence of or repetitive sequence in its uh, centromere. So you can uh, stay in centromeres or you can stay in telomeres as you can see in here, the tips of chromosomes, or you can paint a whole chromosome as, as you can see in here. Now this has been really useful in uh, better uh, I analyze chromosomes and chromosomal aberrations or abnormalities. I'll talk about a uh, final, I'll talk about this technique known as comparative genomic hybridization. So the idea here is that we take uh, chromosomes from the metaphase from controls, uh, control sample and a test sample, a sample from a patient. And this is taken from a, a normal human uh, individual. Now, th these chromosomes are uh, stained red for control, let's say, and the patient's DNA or chromosomes are stained as green. And then they are mixed together. Now, when they are mixed, you will have one strand, you, uh, strands are separated and then uh, chromosomes are allowed to reform. So you can have one strand that is red and another that is uh, green. Now, if the amount of green and red equal, it means that there is nothing um, in, in there is no deletion or 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 addition uh, in this chromosome. But whenever you see that you have more green signal coming out, it means that you have more uh, DNA from the patient sample uh, in this particular region of chromosome. Remember when we talked about gene amplification and we said that like the HER2 in breast cancer and I, and I said that you can have multiple strands of uh, DNA in this region. This is what DNA amplification is. So you have more genetic component from the patient sample than from the normal sample. So you have more green signal than the red signal. Now, whenever you have more red than green, as you can see in here, it means that there is a deletion uh, uh, in the chromosome from the patient sample. Okay, so this is an image right here of a chromosome of comparative genomic hybridization. So you can scan the whole chromosome. So it's all yellow except for this region where you have more green right here, meaning that you have deletion uh, from, your, from the patient sample, deletion, this region of the chromosome in the patient sample. But so comparative genomic hybridization is very useful in uh, identifying deletions or amplifications in chromosomes. But it's laborious because you have to take chromosomes from the metaphase, so uh, it has to be perfect. So scientists uh, are using the same idea of DNA microarray. So we talked about DNA microarray uh, before, and we said that basically it's an array of uh, of uh, different spots. Each spot each spot contains specific DNA sequences or probes. Here. In array-based comparative genomic hybridization, now each spot contains a large segment of DNA, not a small one. Okay, so we take DNA from a controlled DNA, normal DNA, and we take it from a patient. We label DNA green and red. Uh, DNA is fragmented into large pieces, and they are allowed to hybridize on the array. So you can have different uh, different possibilities in here. You have uh, you have equal binding of both green and red DNA, or you can have more DNA, or you can have uh, more red, or you can have more green. If you have more red, it means that there is deletion in the in the patient DNA, and if there is more green, it means that there is amplification in the patient sample, the patient chromosome. Remember that control is control, it's normal. So it would look something like this. It's, it's a small chip, but it contains a lot of spots, a lot of DNA pieces that can be analyzed. So you can look here, you have more of one DNA versus the other.
Okay, so this is high throughput, meaning that you generate a lot of data uh, from uh, array-based comparative genomic hybridization.